All right. Um, can you all hear? Hello? Can you guys hear through this if we go ahead and get started? You can't hear. Let's see. You can hear. It's not yep, there. There's There we go. OK, great. All right. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening for um, tonight's lecture by Esther Choi. Um, as we get started, I wanted to first, um, my name is Jennifer Ackerman. Hi, I'm from the School of Architecture uh, and wanted to um, first say a couple of quick thank yous. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, as I start, as we start, I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, the College of Architecture and Design um, and the Robert B. Memorial Church, um, the third uh, uh, memorial series um, for making this lecture series possible. I also want to thank the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee for their hard work in planning um, a really vibrant lineup um, for the series this year. Um, that committee is chaired by Mark Stanley um, and also includes Gail Fulton, Diane Fox, Felicia Dean, Christopher Coate, and myself. Uh, we strive to bring a diverse set of ideas and uh, ways of modeling how architectural thought and production um, emerge in the world um, and trying to kind of demonstrate as many different ways that architects and designers make a difference um, for our students. And I think that tonight's lecture will, will certainly um, bring some alternative forms of practice uh, into the discussion. Um, so it, it is my extreme pleasure tonight to introduce Esther Choi. Uh, Esther is an artist a writer, an architectural historian, um, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. She brings with her a fascinating academic background. Um, she trained first as a photographer and holds a BFA and an MFA in photography, had a practice as an assistant professor, like a, an academic teaching educational practice, um, uh, as a professor of, par pardon me, the curatoria, there was a really cool name for this. Um, pardon me, uh, of, of criticism and curatorial practice at OCAD University in Toronto. Um, she's also pursued a Master of Design degree from Harvard's GSD within the History and Theory of Architecture program. And so the kind of combination there between photography and design is, is pretty fascinating. Um, she then opted to pursue a PhD of the History and Theory of Architecture from Princeton University conferred in 2019. Her work first came to my attention through the provocative book, Architecture is All Over, um, which you all may have seen be aware of, um, kind of floating around, uh, published in 2017 by Columbia Books on Architecture in the City, and which she co-edited with Merica Trotter. Um, this book claims that architecture is both everywhere and at the same time all over, conventionally, uh, dead, um, right? And in both, po both positions, both dead and everywhere, that architecture is in crisis of various forms. Um, and it also argues that architecture has probably been in crisis for every generation, that this isn't a, a unique kind of condition. Um, it's a really fascinating read, and I highly recommend it. It's a great kind of curated um, volume of, of powerful essays on contemporary practice. Um, in addition to writing and editing thoughtful works on the state of the profession of architecture, Esther is a photographer and artist, and she's the creator of Le Corps Buffet, an artist's cookbook that explores, quote, how the cultural canon is consumed and reproduced. And I think Esther plans to share much of that work with us tonight. Um, though artistic practice and architectural history and theory may seem to be remote from one another, I think Esther is a, a fantastic example of how that doesn't have to be the case. And I was really struck by this, portions of, uh, this portion of Esther's research statement, which in her words say, quote, bridging disciplines, um, her diverse practice has focused on the social architectures of everyday life, often, in, often examining the political potential of ordinary spaces and rituals to act as tools for cultural analysis. In her projects, history and photography are not regarded as ways to simply record facts, but rather as complex practices of description that can reveal the prevailing ideas, assumptions, and experiences of an era, end quote. And Esther Choi's essays on topics related to social practice, ecological politics, and the image economy have appeared in Art Forum, Art Papers, and Pinup, and in publications for the Walker Center, the, excuse me, Wal Walker Art Center, and the Ete Hall of Zurich. And in addition to Architecture is All Over, she is also co-editor of Architecture at the Edge of Everything Else from the MIT Press. So please join me in welcoming Esther Choi to present tonight's lecture. Is this working? Can you hear me? Ish? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. You're, no? <laughs> I'm looking right at you because 
your, yeah, okay. Um, uh, well, thanks very much for the invitation to come to Knoxville to speak to you this evening. Um, uh, it's been a really great uh, day of just getting to, to know you and see your work. Um, so I thought for uh, today, um, I would talk about a project that I released about four months ago in October 2019. Um, I released an artist book entitled Le Corps Buffet with a publisher called Prestel. And the book is really a post-conceptual art project that ap appropriates the format and distribution networks of cookbook publishing to probe questions about history and cultural value. And I thought, it, so I would I thought I would take this opportunity to discuss the project's aspirations and its theoretical frameworks um, as a cultural experiment, all the while keeping in mind that, to borrow a phrase from the art historian George Kubler, I'm very much within the contours of the moment. Um, and so my, my observations will really reflect this perspective. So one of the questions that I have been thinking a lot about um, is, are there ways to capture the artifacts of history, uh, both literally and figuratively, as theoretical tools to understand what also changed the present moment? What does it mean to be a student of history or a writer and maker of history today? What does it mean to consume historical narratives today? Um, we certainly live in a day and age where a sense of historical consciousness has permeated cultural consciousness. Um, so take, for instance, for those of you that read the New York Times, the 1619 Project, which examines the legacy of American slavery in relation to the founding of the U.S. Constitution, in their words, quote, placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Ameri Americans at the very center of the story uh, that Americans tell ourselves about who we are, end quote. Now, the act of both writing history and remembering is, of course, inherently political. What do we choose to remember and why? Who benefits from the narratives and legacies and monuments that are constructed, reified, and studied? And in so doing, what values are communicated? More importantly, who and what gets left out? So my talk today will hopefully attempt to discuss the theoretical frameworks for a project that aims to explore these questions of history and cultural value. So uh, I'm going to take us back to 2014 uh, while I was traveling throughout Europe for research pertaining to my doctoral dissertation at Princeton, which incidentally had nothing to do with food and Le Corbusier. But I found myself lodged in a concrete bunker here, basically a brutalist nightmare or a brutalist paradise designed by Dennis Lasden, depending on where you stand on brutalism. And so my August days had been spent in the University of East Anglia uh, archives, searching and sorting painfully through stacks of paper for clues. So imagine my am amazement when I discovered in this elaborate menu designed by the Hungarian artist Laszlo Moholy Nagy, and the multi-panel bill of fare was for dinner for Walter Gropius, the famed German modernist architect and Bauhaus school founder. Gropius and his family were about to leave London. Like other European modernists uh, in 1937, he and his family had been living in exile, avoiding no Nazi occupation and narrowly escaping a fate that many others did not. So he had accepted a prestigious job at Harvard Graduate School of Design. And so this dinner, this event, marked both an end and a beginning, at once concluding a period of uncertainty and transience, and then also uh, you know, uh, marking the start of yet another chapter of life as immigrants in a foreign country. So this menu, this artifact, uh, led me to start to see Gropius in a slightly different light compared to all of the other documentation that I had seen in the Bauhaus archives, at Harvard's archives, etc. In the way that food can operate as an index of social status, of cultural taste, and lifestyle, and class privilege, it actually allowed me to render a different portrait of a man deemed a genius by most art and design textbooks. As much as the menu revealed the cultural assimilation required of the Gropiuses to survive in England and the United States, it also brought their immense privilege into plain view. Britain's intellectual and artistic literati partook in a glamorous evening of gastronomic indulgences that night, which was far from the typical diet of the average British citizen during a period of interwar rations. So this strange and really beautiful artifact reminded me of how food performs in particularly unique ways, revealing aspects of our society and its structures through subtler means. 
Now certainly the low cost, relatively low cost of food and accessibility have made it a preferred medium for artists and designers engaged in social and cultural commentary. So take, for instance, the artist-run restaurant Food, devised by Carol Gooden, Tina Gerard, and Gordon Matta Clark in the early 1970s. Or consider the feminist collective Woman House's immersive domestic installation of a dining room in 1971. We might consider House Rooker Co.'s edible architectural models for their Food City events, also in the early 1970s. And more recently, Rikrit Tervania's Pad Thai served to museum and gallery goers uh, in, the, in the 90s. Food has prompted new ways to understand and challenge the place of aesthetics in the politics of everyday life. For lodged within the quotidian rituals of commensality are profound questions about the nature of human existence. So we might consider, for example, Alison Knowles' Fluxus performance, Identical Lunch, uh, which began in 1969, in which the artist visited the same luncheonette in Chelsea, New York, at the same time, and ordered the same daily spread, which consisted of a tuna fish sandwich on wheat toast with lettuce and butter, no mayo, and a large glass of buttermilk or a cup of soup. Now, she came to think of the lunch as a performance and published an event score. When reenacted by others, the range of experiences produced by the same meal reveal the work's main philosophical gambit, which is that no object in human experience is identical to itself. Now likewise, the rituals of food consumption, I think, can reveal the basic yet profound truth that we are, of course, the same, but different, alike but unlike. We all must eat in order to survive, yet how and when what eats is anything but universal. As much as food can magnetize relations, it's also a seismograph of privilege. Access to food is a plenty for some, but for others, it's associated with scarcity and toil. Now walk into any average grocery store and you can tell a lot about a neighborhood's demographics. What vegetables or fruit, if any, are available and how much do they cost? I think art and design function in this way too as modes of creative production that can question and dismantle barriers, they can also effectively produce and reinforce them through their participation in privatized channels of market value and art fairs, which, in my mind, limit access. Gropius, like many modernist designers, touted the democratic values of making good products available for the masses. Yet their designs are now stored away in museums and private collections embalmed by the market's insatiable desire for aesthetic consumption. So while creative expression was once regarded as an activity as natural as eating, in today's economy, commensality and aesthetic connoisseurship are becoming increasingly rarefied and inaccessible endeavors, which are really subject to the social systems and institutions that separate the haves from the have-nots. So with all these questions in mind, and inspired by the menu for Gropius's dinner, and the que questions that it raised about the appraisal and elitism of cultural production, I decided to conduct a social experiment a year later. I hosted the first in a series of Le Cours Buffets in my Brooklyn apartment, a project which carried on for two years until 2017. Now these social gatherings revolved around the presentation and consumption of absurd pun-inspired dishes that refer to canonical artists and designers, such as the Carolee Schneeman Meat Joy Balls, an orgy of juicy spiced aromatic lamb kefta piled high over mounds of couscous and roasted vegetables. My guests marveled over the frank conceptual boldness of a platter of Lawrence Wieners, naked, boiled, and unapologetically unadorned. Mouthfuls of a Michael Heiser double negative pavlova were enjoyed in between giggles, its geological meringue peats slathered in the levitating lightness of whipped cream. Now as a satirical comment on the elevated status of art, design, and food as contemporary commodities that are often gobbled up by the market, ironically paralleling their rarefied stat statuses in interwar Britain, the project deliberately twisted idioms to probe the notion of cultural consumption through taste and perception. But the project also sought to be projective at its core, and this is also very important to me throughout all of the work that I do. The Corps Buffet events uh, that followed over the course of the next few years were based on a very simple set of ideas 
many of which were explored already by Fluxus artists. Um, and these were the kind of key ideas that I hoped the book would convey. That perhaps, first, there's a way to reintegrate the presence of art in everyday life, or arte vita, through cooking and experimentation and play. All very accessible uh, resources and techniques that are at our disposal. Second was the notion that perhaps creativity does not require expensive equipment or, or, or rare ingredients. Third, perhaps there's a way to take what's been done before and actually make it your own. So there's a kind of post-production remixing logic at play. Perhaps perfection should also be regarded with suspicion. And perhaps there's something actually revolutionary, especially in this particular and economic this particular political and economic climate in the idea that anyone can make anything, especially tools meant for sharing, using ordinary materials. So as these events continued, I began to take them more seriously. They really began as sculpt kind of sketches or kind of ways of thinking through these theoretical problems rather than you know, performances. But I started to take them more seriously as social sculptures, considering how artworks and design works can actually catalyze forms of alchemical transformation or let's say energy conversion rather than operate as strictly aestheticized objects. So it interested me in how an artistic gesture could be designed furtively, secretively, as a small gesture in the form of a simple dinner. And can you imagine just sitting around the table with a handful of friends and asking, can you pass the flan flavin? I also began to take an active interest in how the politics of hospitality, that is the art of sharing, could be a platform for critical and political practice. Uh, Marshall Silence has written about the role of food in non-Western cultures as a medium for kinship structures. And he talks about how food, in these particular instances, results in a form of what he calls productive consumption, a form of productive consumption that Marx did not imagine. So in this day and age, when privatized and unequal access to the commons has essentially become the norm, I'd like to argue that there's really nothing simple or straightforward about preparing something to be shared for someone else, especially if you don't know them. Um, in this way, I started to think about the kitchen and the dinner table as imaginative contact zones for asking questions about how we wish to live together and what conventions constructions or narratives actually prevent us from doing so. Okay, so some years passed, and in 2018, the universe decided to send me another gift. So I had sent an invitation for one of my core buffets to a curator friend, and I received a call from him. He happened to have lunch with an editor at Prestel, who was an old college friend, Prestel being one of the oldest art and design publishers in the world. And the editor had been explaining how after the economic recession, cookbooks were really the only lucrative format for publishing. And wouldn't it be great if she could come across a project that triangulated the imprint's new interest with food with their kind of legacy of art and design publishing. So he showed her the invitation and I received an email from her shortly after. Prior to being contacted, I knew that I wanted to somehow turn the Le Corbuffet project into a publication, but I thought of it as this kind of lofty theoretical manifesto, and so it was serendipitous when I heard from this editor. But I still wasn't sure of what form the project would take. Cookbooks were definitely not on my radar, uh, you know, as an artist or as a scholar, and sure, as an avid home cook, I owed, owned a large collection of them, but I had really never considered them as an artistic or even a political format. But certainly, as I start to think more about this, there was, there's a history of artworks that have adopted the format of the cookbook to explore how rituals can provide a space for play and invention, and essentially question how and why it is that we do the things that we do. So consider the Futurist Cookbook from 1932, in which Marinetti rallied for the political possibilities of a low-carb low diet. Or consider Salvador Dali's illustrated ode to gastronomic surrealism, Le Dîner de Gala, from 1972, which featured an array of sensual delicacies in extremely unusual formats and configurations. So as a conceptual art, uh, artwork and an artist book, the publication Le Corbuffet Buffet uh, decidedly appropriated the format and conventions of cookbook publishing, essentially framing the cookbook as a kind of literal manual for consumption and production, 
to further explore how, in many ways, economic values shape what cultural legacies and artifacts we choose to consume and reproduce. Now, it was designed by Studio Lin, a graphic design firm based in New York City. And the illustrated compendium contains about 60 functional recipes, real recipes that work, um, that are written according to, were very similar to Fluxus action scripts, along with photographs of edible sculptures. So as a cultural experiment, the book sought to circulate a critical proposition about cultural consumption into the pre-existing circulation networks of cookbook publishing. Now, images of food created by the food, biotech, and lifestyle industries shape not only what we think of as nutritive and cultural, they also tell us about prevailing ways of thinking at the time. So ideas related to contemporary technology and industry, social organization, economics, and ecological politics. For anyone on social media, it's evident how cuisine has become a cipher for class privilege, no longer just an issue of preparation or nutrition. But really, images of food have become an index of what Elizabeth Curd Halkett has referred to as the aspirational class. So as a signifier of education and income, the wellness and lifestyle industries in particular, and their kind of attendant mantras of going to the farmer's market, eating kale, going on a juice cleanse, or buying local and organic, are one of the many ways that Kurt Halkett argues has replaced Veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption. So with this in mind, the photographs, the still life photographs in the book, seek to really push against this visual rhetoric often placing imperfect produce and home-cooked items, albeit, in my opinion, still very functional and tasty items, beside the waste products that they're sold in. And so approached from the vantage of sculpture and photography, the irregularity and imperfection in these images was actually more interesting to me aesthetically, rather than churning out perfect images of handcrafted items that resembled industrial products and commodities, which is typically how we think about food today and the image economy around food. The recipes as well were written akin to event scores. So the graphic designers Alex Lin and Jenna Myung, who designed the book, thought really carefully about how references to things like 1960s process art could be echoed in the typographic approach used in the book. And so for this reason, there was a monospace type that they used to echo the dominant kind of writing technology of the 1960s, which were typewriters. Uh, from which most process art, instruction sets, and recipe cards were written. The point size of the ingredient lists are also exploded to enhance the materiality, again alluding to the sculptural qualities of the foods themselves and the, mater and the kind of material conditions. So instructions are written with a nod, as I said, to Flux's event scores to encourage the reader to, to become a participant, to consider particular material, perceptual or experiential aspects of creation with the aim of forging a relationship between the domestic space of the kitchen to the studio. And each recipe is also written with a preface to introduce a work, which may or may not be well known to a reader, um, and introducing perceptual and conceptual ways of connecting with an art or design work rather than market evaluation. And, and in this sense, I was really thinking about how the kind of dominant narratives that we ascribe to these works that we study, in some ways are really actually driven by the market, right? Where very rarely do you find these kind of more critical narratives that try to unpack the problematics of the Bauhaus, the kind of social exclusion of the Bauhaus. There's always this rhetoric around the kind of socialist mandate of the Bauhaus, for example. Um, so how I chose the artists and designers in the collection, which is usually a question I get asked, were really, in some ways, largely uh, left to the puns themselves. So I had to be able to make a pun that would translate to a dish. Um, but also, I had to really think carefully about the number of recognizable names um, and in the collection and how these could be offset with less recognizable figures, often people of color. And this was a, a really long set of conversations I had with, with my publisher about this, um, about creating a project that draws the questions of what gets, what gets included and what gets left out, and, you know, that becomes part of the project. So here's an example of, of one recipe. This is an example for an okonomi recipe, which is essentially a kind of Japanese um, cabbage pancake. So the text reads, in Yoko Ono's 1969 performance, Cut Piece, 
Participants approached the seated artist, adorned in her best suit, and proceeded to cut portions of her garment off with a pair of scissors. In accordance with the score, a set of instructions written by the artist, participants could keep the portion of the garment they had cut. Now, whereas for Ono, cut piece was largely a study of how much people will choose to take, the cut in this Okonomi recipe performs as an act leading to amassment, adornment, and sharing. A giant vegetarian pancake is created magically com by combining threads of elastic batter, which hold together mounds of shredded cabbage, so lots of cuts. Once fried, the crispy mound is further decorated with fragments of ginger, seaweed bonito, and tempura bits, and served communally with scissors. Guests are encouraged to snip portions of the pancake to serve to others rather than keep for themselves. So each recipe um, had a kind of, uh, you know, invocation of how one could maybe challenge normative sharing patterns. And my interest was really how this book might in some ways tap the pre-existing distribution systems of mainstream cookbook publishing and circulate to audiences that I would otherwise never interface with, uh, many of whom are totally unsuspecting, to encounter a very different set of narratives and images that attempt to politicize and draw awareness to social commentary and questions of cultural value. And so the idea, of course, is that by encouraging participants to use food to produce quote unquote replicas of cultural works and narratives that will inevitably wildly deviate from the originals, the project hopes to rewrite and recalibrate and disseminate these cultural legacies and artifacts with new sets of values and interpretations. So in this regard, in thinking about how a book as a kind of art and design object could be operative, kind of, kind of like create, a, be a kind of theorizable object that functions in the world instead of me, you know, writing theory, let's say, um, I looked to a number of references. And so in 2002, the post-conceptual artist Seth Price published an essay entitled Dispersion that sought to ask the question of how artists could intervene politically in a burgeoning image economy. So you have to remember in 2002, the internet was becoming increasingly ubiquitous with home computing, images were in circulation as JPEGs, net art was proliferating, et cetera, et cetera. So Price's essay essentially anticipated the Tumblr and Pinterest culture that would form from around 2007 onwards. And so his essay, which you can still actually access, is designed as a downloadable PDF it argued that participating in and subverting circulation and distribution networks rather than production was one of the defining characteristics of how artworks could accrue meaning. And Price advocated inhabiting a kind of given system of cultural production and distribution and thus working within its constraints and formula as a kind of contemporary reworking of the ready-made. Now, Price's essay is, is totally fascinating. I would really encourage you to take a look at it. But in many ways, his thesis had actually already been theorized and tested over a decade earlier. And here, for those of you that are probably born you know, after 1980, you might not know this reference, but I remember this as a child, and it's kind of triggered this memory. It's this radio clip. Freedom. a year later, the KLF revealed themselves to be an elaborate hoax, 
a cultural experiment that sought to prove the formulaic nature of the music industry. And so they self-published a book that year called The Manual, which you can still find online, which explained how to essentially hack the music industry and reach a number one hit so that anyone could do it and become a millionaire. And actually, many groups have since actually consulted the manual and achieved great success. Now, the KLF would also go on, go, go on to be known as these kind of cultural antagonists, at one time burning a million pounds and then turning the ashes into a brick, which I thought you'd like as architecture students. Um, they also, as a kind of push against the Turner Prize, which is the kind of greatest art prize uh, you know, in, in Britain, they had the kind of anti-Turner Prize, where they awarded a million pounds to the worst artist that they would deem you know, in Britain. Um, and so the person would be forced to either accept the award or they would burn the money. So they were really kind of, you know, constantly in the kind of news media with these skits, you know, these kinds of hoaxes. Now, you're probably wondering why I decided to title my talk Doctor in the TARDIS, and apparently there was another talk today that also dealt with the TARDIS, which is really strange coincidence. But Doctor in the TARDIS was actually a, a hit song by the KLF, which reached number one in the UK singles chart in June 1988. And the song made reference to the TARDIS, which was a fictional time machine and spacecraft in the science fiction television series Doctor Who, which I also watched as a child. So appearing as a telephone booth, the TARDIS, which stands for Time and Relative Dimension in Space, possessed certain perceptual powers that enabled it to camouflage with its surroundings unaware to passers-by. So there's all these skits in Doctor Who where you enter the TARDIS and you're actually in this massive control room. Um, but then, you know, it's perceived to be this really kind of quotidian object that most people ignore. In the same way, I thought a lot about how a cookbook is rarely an object that we consider a venue for critical historical inquiry. But when recalibrated as a tool for historical transportation, Le Corbusier really, as a book, aspired to operate as a shape-shifting object, like the TARDIS one that could travel through distribution systems to ask critical questions about history and cultural value. Now, what's been interesting is observing the kind of effects of the book in the world. So upon its release in the fall of 2019, it instantly entered the cultural water supply, to borrow a phrase from my friend, uh, and appeared in publications such as the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, Vanity Fair France, AD Magazine, Dezine, and even American Vogue. What was so puzzling to me, especially, is when publications touting luxury as their focus um, co-opted Le Corbusier in their shopping lists for coffee table offerings, um, when the entire project is really quite Marxist in its kind of, you know, in its kind of theoretical framework. So it's been really interesting to see how it sort of proved its point about cultural c consumption. Literally, I just got a text about another German magazine that somehow also co-opted it in some other capacity. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious for when the journalists will actually read the book and s kind of realize what they're actually um, really promoting in a way, which I'm very grateful for. But it's been a really interesting um, experience to see it actually you know, maneuver these circulation networks. And so, in this sense, like the TARDIS, the book aspires to adopt an unassuming and chameleonic form to really hopefully act as a subversive tool for cultural inquiry. Um, and so, in this sense, the publication itself really tries to kind of lodge itself with a lineage of artworks and design works that adopt uh, the motif of domesticity um, to imagine rituals and the ordinary and the quotidian and the everyday as accessible sites for critical and social engagement. Now, the German artist Joseph Beuys wrote uh, and spoke a lot about this idea of social alchemy. It's an idea that he inherited from Rudolf Steiner um, and his idea of what he called a social architecture, a phrase that I often borrow, which for Beuys represented a kind of new living model of social reality. For Steiner and for his acolyte Beuys, the prosaic materiality of common objects allowed them to act as tools for transforming existing conditions into a new living model of social difference. Now, Steiner is particularly interesting, uh, a very multifaceted character, um, because he sought to make the sympathetic relation between self and the world, and otherwise, in his mind, an alchemical force, into a kind of modern medium. And so his model of social ecology, which is essentially appropriated from the natural sciences and visual culture, 
viewed the world of sensible things generated out of human intuition and imagination, such as biodynamic agricultural practices or paintings, or in this instance, functional objects that he designed as contact zones between the self and the sometimes non-human other. And what I think is particularly astute in Steiner's work is his implicit recognition of technological objects, such as chairs or architecture or books, as expressions derived from particular values and contexts that become fur further perpetuated and brought forth into reality through their use. So the use value is in incredibly important. And likewise, as a devotee of Steiner's principles, Joseph Beuys took up Steiner's call for an alchemy of the everyday through his use of props and sculptures, often in his performances. Now, typically, these everyday ordinary objects were interpreted by many art historians to convey a collective social vision through the symbolic depiction of processes. But I would actually argue that they performed a very different, very practical function as conduits and mediators for the production of new experiences, their use brought different constituencies into relation to produce new centers of gravity. So for both figures, social transformation could take place through a collective ritual interaction with the objects that comprise the everyday environment, echoing Goethe's maxim, art is the mediator of the inexpressible. And so likewise, to close, I just would like to say that I'm also really interested in the kind of epistemological function of technical objects and their ability to code rituals or ways of thinking and ways of experiencing the world. This is what brought me into architecture from art practice. We might consider cookbooks not only as domestic manuals, but also as instruction sets and thus social tools, much like buildings or artworks that aggregate resources, labor, and attention to, pr to produce material configurations and social outcomes by translating rituals of cooking or eating, relating, the discussion, into quasi-automated protocols. And so cookbooks, as cultural forms, are literally, in this way, manuals containing algor algorithms for both production and consumption. Recipes, in particular, I think, are fascinating cultural forms as they often allude to the creation of a replicable object and experience whose original is more often than not unknown. I mean, who can claim to have experienced the first, the original chicken pot pie, or the first, the original crepe Suzette? We're all kind of constructing, constructing replicas based on an imagined ideal. And this is much like how I think canonical works of art and design that we study and rarify are often known, really, as JPEGs or ideas rather than erratic experiences that are material, material and perceptual. Um, and in this sense, cookbook culture mirrors, I think, the post-production status of art and design works today. So as an artist who came to architectural history and theory about a decade ago via conceptual pursuits in my art practice, my interest in history really stems from this desire to explore how contexts and privileges that shape both cultural memory and cultural production in turn influence belief systems and ideas, and how these in turn structure the perceptions and materi material realities of everyday experience. And so for me, this project um, hopes or seeks to understand history and or to think about how history is central to how art and design can operate as critical forms and how artists and designers can engage in what Theodore Adorno would call imminent criticism, to reflexively question the production of culture and its relationship to ideologies and systems of power while participating in the culture. And in this sense, I see, I guess, you know, all the kind of varied uh, avenues of my output, whether it's scholarship or, or art projects or writing, in alignment with the goals of new historicism, um, by focusing on the emissions and erasures of dominant historical narratives in an effort to hopefully recuperate these histories from the margins, but also actively occupy the absences as a place from which to create anew. So I think I'm going to end there. Um, I've opened this up for questions, if you have any. Okay.
Hello. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, I, I s was interested a little bit, you spoke about the Bauhaus being having a little bit of an alienating practice. And with their work being um, now over 100 years ago, I was kind of wondering what uh, you see as the, the sort of future of who's participating in this, these new histories and how that'll move forward as a, a, a potentially a collective similar to Bauhaus, how that was kind of a powerhouse at one point, but kind of wondering who's writing these histories and how that's getting put out there. That's a great question. I think there's a lot of really interesting scholarship especially now if you look at the topics that most people are pursuing in PhD programs, for example, at least in the United States, um, there's a lot of this kind of new historicist influence, which actually comes from, it doesn't come from architecture. New historicism is actually a discourse coming from like, you know, basically the humanities. Um, but it's this attempt about rethinking history from the margins. So you'll have, there's a lot of, I think really exciting, I mean so many that I don't know who to, where to begin, but the question right now, and we just had a discussion with women in design, is about platforms. Right, so who would publish that material? Who publishes, who's interested in publishing a counter history or a history from the margins? And this is where I think, in tandem with new scholarship, we need new platforms, right? So new publishing platforms. But also, this is also to say that, you know, as much as history can be problematized, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm a historian by training and I'm interested in the problems of history, such that I'm not interested in, in throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? So. The, the Bauhaus has many um, problematics, let's say, around kind of its constituencies and the narratives that it pursued. So women from the Bauhaus were essentially eradicated, right? There's like no people of color in the Bauhaus at all. And yet there's a kind of democratic program of turning out industrial products that can somehow shape everyday, you know, reform a kind of civilized society, right? So there's already a very specific political project around subjectivity at play. So for me, it's, what's interesting is actually really dealing with the difficulties of that program and I think that that needs to be questioned because we learned the histories unquestioningly in studios, you know, in my curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. And yet those kinds of outmoded ways of thinking about subjectivity do not align with the kind of pluralistic society that we live in today, right? So there has to be a way of rethinking the kind of what's, what's missing from that program, learning from the successes of it, but also really, really rethinking and retooling history in a sense so that it can be recalibrated you know, as a kind of, uh, as a learning opportunity in that sense, or a theorizable object. Um, so I think maybe, I would like to be really optimistic. I think it's only a matter of a few years in, uh, that we'll start to see new books being put out in the world. But it's also, a, like, I, I put a lot of pressure on my colleagues, right, as historians or as people teaching studio. Who do you decide to put on your syllabus, right? And so will people think about Lena Bobardi as someone that belongs in the historical canon, or will she continue to be marginalized, right? Does Lily Reich take an equal place beside Mies van der Rohe, or does she continually get omitted, right? So these are the kinds of questions that I have to continually contend with uh, as an educator, but also in my practice as an artist, these are things that really interest me, so. But I'm optimistic. <laughs> Thanks, Esther, that, that was really cool. Um, great look at the work. It's all really, really interesting to me and fantastic. Um, I was just wondering about, as you were talking, about the role of irony in, in mm. culture. Because, I mean, over the last few years, everything seems ironic to a degree that nothing is ironic. So, like, right. what's... I love the work, and I think it exceeds irony, but I just wonder, like, what's the role of irony in a post-irony cultural condition? Excellent question. I literally just had this conversation with someone else that I think I'm... I don't mean for this to sound like a total cop out, but I totally understand what you're what you're um, identifying and observing. I also agree. This is a kind of post ironic ironic condition. It kind of reminds me of Andrew Zago wrote an essay years ago in any uh, in Log about looking. He was like desperate search for post ironic authenticity. That was his. Uh, but this was years ago. Even at this point, the essay is quite dated. But it's still something that's really stuck with me. Um, and I don't know how to answer that question because I think that somehow with the rapidity of how markets gobble up commodities, even watching this project, it gobbled up. Um, seeing it in a luxury, it was like a luxury men's magazine from Los Angeles, you know, beside uh, mansions and Rolexes, right? Because the architecture section was just like mansions that were on the market for over, you know, a million dollars, and then Rolexes, and then weirdly this book. So I don't, I don't know how to answer that question, and I, I assume that maybe hopefully in a couple of years I'll have a better I can use this as a kind of theorizable object, 
to think through that question because it's one that's deeply interesting to me. And if anyone else has, I don't know, thoughts about that, I would love to hear that because I, uh, I, I do think it's, uh, it's, it's troubling. It's troubling that um, satire, has, it, things get absorbed so quickly that it's difficult to think about what a resistant model can actually look like in, that can sustain itself in a way. <laughs> well, I've also gotten a lot of flack for it, but yeah. I mean, right. Well, I think if I'm, if not to be too biographical, but I think, you know, operating as an academic, uh, publishing in journals or kind of conventional modes of publishing, right, and art criticism, architectural criticism, et cetera, um, I felt like in some ways I was sort of sitting on my hands a little bit, like pointing to the, the ills of society, but um, not necessarily always totally leveraging my skill set to think through how I could then insert a kind of theorizable object in the world and see how it actually operates. So, you know, I, I've had a lot of, um, there's been a mixed reaction, you know, it hasn't been like totally celebratory. I mean, academia has been really, they've been troubled by this project in a lot of ways because of the fact that it's not um, operating within a kind of traditional academic language, let's say. Um, my hope is that once you open the book, there's something else happening. But, um, but I, you know, for me, as a cultural experiment, I, I had to sort of, you know, take the opportunity. And, I, and in that way, I think, like, this is obviously not architecture, but I, my training in architectural history and theory really has informed how I think about everyday objects. If you think about a building as an opportunity, or even like a partition wall as an opportunity for thinking through certain kinds of, you know, spatial politics, et cetera, et cetera, right? That everyday ordinary things actually have a, through habituation and use, actually have incredible value and political, political value. Um, but this just happens to take the form of a cookbook, so, yeah. Any other questions? Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, I, I find your work very uh, palatable, so thank you for this uh, great picture. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> if this work only exists in picture form or if it has a sort of uh, physical presence in an art museum, almost like the uh, banana and duct tape scenario. Right. Uh, I've, I've been asked that question a lot primarily by gallerists that are interested in thinking about, you know, like how, how this could operate in other contexts. I'm, I've thought about that question for a while and I, I think for the project to remain, to retain its integrity, it has to remain a book that operates in the world. I think the minute that I try to reify it into some kind of other set of commodities, it loses its, its point in a way, right? So. Um, yeah. Right. It's already happened, actually, weirdly. Um, the amount of uh, media outlets that just appropriate the images because they just get, grab people's attention and republish them, sometimes without my permission, <laughs> um, has been happening a lot. Um, I think I think Catalan's project is a little bit different than mine in that sense. Like it, for me, the images are now circulating in the world as like their own thing, right? But as a kind of conceptual project, I think my hope is that they actually lead to the book, and then my hope in turn is that people actually participate in what the book is prompting them to do. The action is really, the act of participating is, is important to me, as opposed to, you know, some blogs that have been advocating buying it because the color scheme is, you know, works nicely with your sofa, right? Literally, there was an article about this in a, in a lifestyle thing. So anyways, so that, that for me is less interesting. Um, 
Um, but I take your point, and this, you know, this is to say, again, like I'm within the contours of the moment, right? So it's only been out for a few months, but it already has been completely called. I mean, literally, I just got a text message today about, a, there's a spread in a German, like a really well-known German magazine, cultural magazine, where they just reprinted the, the image that you see on the poster for this lecture without asking. Well, I mean, I wasn't asked. Maybe they asked my publisher, but, um, but it's just, it's, it's operating like a meme in certain ways. So my hope was that the pictures themselves, the images themselves can be subversive as standalone objects, right? Like to ask questions around like, what does it mean for edible, edible foods to operate as commodities on par with things that you get from a hardware store? When really, when you think about like as commodities, they're not actually that different, you know? Um, so there are these kinds of subtle cues, but I, I'm, I'm curious about people's visual literacy um, and how they consume images, and I'm not entirely convinced that because of the surplus of images that we're inundated with every day that we're actually really seeing, if that makes sense, like really being able to decipher what's in front of us, um, and the images seem to sort of speak to that so far. I think that's a great question. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe I would open this up to everyone if, if you can think of collectively of other examples. Um, I don't, I don't really see. I see architects. I mean, it's the issue with the academy, right? Is that it kind of operates as a bubble in a way, and we tend to have conversations amongst ourselves. But whether it interfaces with a larger public, not always clear. Um, I, I'm not convinced that architectural exhibitions really achieve that. Most people don't know how to read a model. You know, they just look at these weird foam core, you know, study models and walk away. Um, so I'm, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question, really. I can't. I think, you know, I think architects, some architects seem to be exploring um, interventions that operate at a different scale, given, like, the kind of protocols around building and how slow building is, right? So furniture seems to be something that a lot of, architects seem to be interested in. I mean, historically, architects would operate through installations, you know, historically, right, um, as quick ways of kind of communicating ideas to a public. But um, I would love to see more of the spirit of the 60s in some ways, like the House Rupert Co. food events that they had. I mean, they had one in Central Park. They had one in the Walker, um, where they created these really amazing, elaborate models, urban models, ba you know, with Wonder Bread and cake mix and it was a really participatory and incredibly well-attended event, but for them it was a social catalyst to have questions around urbanism. And I don't know, I, I, I'm not particularly precious around like certain kinds of um, coded materials when it comes to expressing architectural ideas, and I think I'm all for kind of re-embracing that historical moment of the 60s in that sense and rethinking like what other kinds of toolkits we can use to generate conversations that are timely and important in informing then a work that you might do in more architectural terms or, or, or might not, you know? So, yeah, but if, I mean, I would totally open this up to everyone because I mean, definitely, I mean, I've definitely been branded a weirdo for this work, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a spokesperson for the weirdos yet, so <laughs> I don't know the other ones yet, <laughs> but yeah. Right.
Sure, yeah. So in terms of the kind of like twofold status of the object as the thing that people just consume and buy because it's on the shopping list or it's on the, you know, right? Like Epicurious put it on their list of books your dad will like. <laughs> I guess. I didn't know I hit that, that niche market, but apparently uh, I did. So, um, so I was, I've been really, so I don't know if you've read Soft Power by Joseph Nye. Have you guys read that book? So you'll, you'll find it is like in a $1.99 bin somewhere, but it's fascinating. So basically Joseph Nye was the head of the School of Government at Harvard for many years, and he wrote this book that was actually a critique of the Bush administration's foreign policy called Soft Power. What's really fascinating about Soft Power is that uh, for me it becomes a really empowering um, analysis of the political function of culture. So Nye basically argues that the Bush administration, senior, um, their failure on the part of thinking about the role of culture in perpetuating images, like as in, in an international relations capacity, images of the United States, right, as friendly, convivial, seductive, et cetera, et cetera, um, they focused on basically hard power, like top-down legislation, but that images, culture, has a kind of seductive role. I mean, certainly we know soft power's effects via advertising, right? Where we can buy into something. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how a lot of works from the 1960s, for example, like the kind of stuff that we think of as extra architectural, inflatables, et cetera, really were interested in soft power. Like how do you use seduction, sensuality, uh, perception, play, uh, free spiritedness as a kind of tool to then aggregate attention into a kind of conversation that hopefully then unpacks, you know, ideas in a more cr critical light. So, so that was sort of uh, um, my aspiration on that level. Um, the, but this, the second point that you make around the canon, um, I would say, you know, any, anyone who's done, in a, a, like, historians will know pretty much all of the artworks and design works that I have included. And I've get, gotten feedback from people where they say, well, you know, I, don't, I didn't know Helio Otisica's uh, work, right? So but my, for me, the point is not that you have to know this, this particular artist. So for me, the question is, well, okay, we can easily Google who he is, right? So I, the, the kind of caption, the introductory caption is important because it sets up the way to think about the work. So in this particular way, I think about his parangoles, which were these kind of like wearable architectures, right, very performative, as ways of thinking about uh, cultural identity and immigration and, eth and ethnicity in a global context. So for me, I start to think about it. I mean, I was very much, I wrote this book in a very political, particular political moment where questions of food and migration were at the core of my interest in thinking about how the, it can be, the narrative itself can be a tool unpacking some of these issues. So, um, so I start to think about how the dumpling, really, like, is there a culture that doesn't have a dumpling? It's pretty amazing, actually, when I started to make a list that most cultures have some form of a dumpling, right? The insides and the outsides might slightly change, but there's this idea of some kind of substantive, nutritive thing in a wrapper. So I started to think about how the dumpling starts to mirror the parangle. Uh, the kind of inhabitable thing, but also then, can I do a kind of cross-cultural mashup? And so I have family from Bolivia, and my mom grew up eating these Bolivian, you know, so I kind of look to Bolivia, and I kind of make it a soup dumpling, and I kind of do this kind of hybridized thing. That is, has nothing to do with, you know, understanding the artwork as such, but for me, it became a kind of um, opportunity to offer my own subjectivity in the sense, but also a kind of new interpretation of how an artwork, you know, the kind of signification of an artwork or what, how one could interpret it. Other historians have had very different interpretations of, of the work, right? So, um, but, you know, I think with working with a mainstream publisher or in any capacity, I mean, as architects, you know, you have people, you have commissioning systems you have to contend with, you have clients, you have different stakeholders and constituencies that all want different things out of a project. and. For my publisher, it was really important that the book actually operate as a sellable object. They didn't want to go broke. For them, it was really important that the book had very recognizable names. And of course, I had to push back and say, well, then I'm just basically reifying a canon, which is already really problematic and very limited. So it was continually, the entire book is a negotiation of many stakeholders involved in that process. Um, you know, I think if I had self-published, it might look very different, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm sort of operating within a pre-existing system that has pre-existing values. 
that are, might be different than mine, right? So I have to think about how to mitigate all of those loopholes, very much like how you have to when you're making a building or et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but my hope was that I could sneak in there with a bit of a, you know, a bit of a poke, a bit of a wink, a bit of a nod to then, even if I did take a really canonical, uh, you know, well, Rosalind, maybe Rosalind Krauss is maybe not the most canonical. For those of us that have studied, you know, art history, like, you know, she's, she's part of the canon, but, you know, are there ways that someone who isn't, you know, versed in art history could still find humor in this or find it accessible in some ways, but most importantly, I think, start to empower themselves. Um, and this is partly due to my own kind of, like, I wrote this book while finishing my dissertation. Uh, this was the project I did when I was procrastinating on my dissertation. And I didn't have access to a traditional studio. So this is, the project is very biographical in some ways of thinking about what resources I had at my disposal and how to think resourcefully about those resources. And, you know, my apartment has a kitchen, right? So, and I, previous to this, I had never worked with food. So this was really a kind of project that stemmed from my own rethinking about how one creates meaning in a world, right? When resources are not handed to you or maybe not in traditional forms, and how you can kind of leverage what you have to then rethink a set of relationships. Hi. Oh, sure. So uh, that's another project about when you work without a studio, what to do. <laughs> so. Um, I've been working on a project that deals with the legacy of the Bauhaus. Um, actually, I should have explained that some of these images probably didn't totally make sense, but the images of the furniture that you saw, there's little squares because it comes from a different project, where I've been taking an inventory of the furniture in the Harvard Art Museums of the Bauhaus collection um, and working with performers where we start to think about how the furniture literally molds the human body in particular ways as a kind of metaphor for thinking about how the Bauhaus project had a social project attached to it, right? So this idea of molding subjectivity. So I've been working with dancers, um, very different project, but in so doing was looking a lot at the history of theater and performance in the Bauhaus and Oscar Schlemmer's book, Man, I mean, the title alone, it's a little bit <laughs> problematic. Um, I started revisiting the literature produced out of you know, via Bauhaus members around subjectivity. And I thought the Schlemmer book was super interesting and problematic um, in the way that he uses a mathematical and geometric language to striate the human body. But I, I found it to be a kind of, you know, index of other kinds of ideological, um, you know, att attempts being made, let's say, uh, via his rhetoric. So what I did was basically t took apart the book um, so I ordered like an old copy of it and started taking it apart and sort of reworking um, using the book itself as a space of inscription. So using uh, techniques of cancellation, of, you know, put running through a printer multiple times, like certain kinds of images, um, and starting to degrade the kind of integrity of the form as a kind of way of thinking about redaction, omission, historically, but also v visually, right? Um, because he's really trying to cancel out certain aspects of the human body, and especially difference. So I think it's really telling that the one time you see, you know, a person, uh, you know, inhabiting like a Marcel Breuer chair, it's the, you know, that famous image of the, of the, the one woman at the Bauhaus that you never see because she has a mask over her face, and it was like a Schlemmer mask, right? So it was really a kind of way of trying to engage with how to occupy how do you occupy emission such that the image, the emission becomes registered as a kind of literal positive, if that makes sense? Um, so that's sort of just a few images from many images from the book that I've been working on. Yeah. Cool, thank you.